Thank you, Lord. I want to take a few minutes this morning, and uh, we're going to we're going to uh, talk about the Christian walk. Matthew mentioned a few minutes ago when you get out of bed in the morning, God is looking to bless you. He said in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, the prophetic word, "I know the plans I have for you." Plans not to harm you, but to prosper you and give you hope and to give you a future. He says, now let's do this thing. Let's, let's, let's get it on. Let's make it happen. And every day, God is looking to, pro- to, to produce something in your life that enhances the walk that he's prepared for you. And the thing about it is, What God has for us and what he's planned for us does not fall on us instantly like like ripe cherries off a tree or something. You have to go after it. Amen? You have to, not because God is withholding, say, I'm not going to let this go until, no, but because you happen to be living in intimate territory. I mean, I don't even have to, to preach it to you, but I'd say pretty much everybody here knows that this world system is being run by demonic powers. It don't take a whole lot of figuring to know that that's where we are. And and the enemy will work overtime to keep you from being blessed, keep you from being whole and strong, victorious, prosperous. He He will work overtime to stop that. Our responsibility is to walk in ways to please God and allow him an entrance into our lives since we begin to walk with him. I want to read a few verses here. I'm going to read a a, a portion from John chapter 8. John chapter 8. When we talk about the way we walk after we've been, we've been brought into God's kingdom, you see, God has made you perfect in your spirit man. You've been recreated and, and brought into God's kingdom and accepted in the beloved. The thing about it is you've got to walk in a body that's been challenged by the powers of hell to succumb to the world, the flesh, and the devil, to do evil things. I want to show you this from Scripture here, and uh, I will not exhaust the Scriptures pertaining to this, but I want to show you some things. In in John chapter 8, remember the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious groups, they were trying to kill Jesus. Their intention was to destroy him. Let me read this. Uh, I'm going to read, start at verse 40. I'd like to read the whole chapter, but we won't take time to do all that. Let's, Let's just start at verse 40. Jesus said, but now you seek to kill me, a man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You know, Abraham didn't do this. That's not, that's not the way he walked, because they were saying they were Abraham's children. And Jesus is going to contradict that. He said, Abraham was not like you are. He he was here. He wouldn't be trying to kill me. All right, verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Now listen to verse 44. This is a powerful word that Jesus said to these religious people. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father 
you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that particular scripture, but I do want you to see that this is a, a, I mean, this is not just a scripture. This is Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, wrapped in flesh, saying these words. And he said about some people who thought they were God's children. They said it. We're, we have one Father God. And he contradicted them. He said, you're of your father the devil. Can you imagine you are, you're professing I am of my Father God. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself look you in the face and says, you're of your father, the devil. Wow. I don't want to get up to that any day. You don't want, <laughs> you don't want to have to deal with that accusation, that, that, that declaration. Some may say amen to that. You are of your father the devil, and listen, he said, and, and the lust of your father, the worldly will, worldly ambition, fleshly ambition, he said, that's what you're going to do. He said he was a murderer, and now they were seeking to kill Jesus. He was a murderer from the beginning, and, and, and he abode not in the truth. As a matter of fact, he said, he's a father of lies. Now, I'm just going to take a few minutes and, and uh, refer to some of the things in Scripture that God has, ex has, has exhorted us to follow in, to walk in. Because we're challenged today to let it go and live any old slipshod way you want because it don't matter. And if, if, if I could find this scripturally, I'd preach it to you. But the more we study this thing, the more we realize that God has called us to walk in his way, in his word. And I just want to take a few minutes to talk about some of the, some of the steps we are supposed to be taking, some of the walks we're supposed to be walking. And I like the scripture in 1 Peter 2 and 9. It says, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's who we are. Now, this, this book of 1 Peter, it is believed that it is written to Jews and Gentiles. It's, it's a general epistle. And it's for you, and it's for me, and it's for anyone who declares that they are a child of God. And he says, you're chosen. You're royal, you're peculiar, you're holy. So if that be the case, I just want us to, you know, not from a religious perspective, but, but just, just receive this this morning. You are chosen, you're royal, you're holy, you're peculiar. Just because you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior. We used to sing that one time. We don't sing it anymore. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of God. See, now, <clears throat> we quit singing that because we got tired of it, I suppose. But isn't it interesting that we are making declaration from the word about who we are? That's exactly what we're doing. And when you make declaration from the word of God and you sing about who you are instead of all the time what you want. Oh, God bless me. And there's nothing wrong with invoking the blessing of God on your life and on the church and whatever. But we have to be careful that we don't, we don't put aside our recognition of who we are in Christ. And thank God there's still some great songs coming out like that as well. But... If we, are, if we are of our Father God, 
Now, the scribes and the Pharisees were planning to kill Jesus, and they said, we are of our Father, God. And Jesus contradicted them. My question to us this morning, are we safe to be able to stand before God and say, God, you are my Father, and not have him contradict us? Hello? Hey, are, you, are you happy? I was going to say, is you happy, but... 100%. All right. All right. Is God your father? Are you bold enough to declare, God is my father? We need to sense a yes and an amen from God when we say that. There need to be a witness on the inside of us saying, yes, you are my child. I don't mean you're going to hear God say, thou art my child. I don't mean that. But you just know that you know that you know. There's, a, there's this just knowing inside. Yes, God loves me. Yes, he's my father. Now, having established the fact that because of Jesus, we become one with him. And he's not ashamed to call us brother, and Paul said in Hebrews. And... and if that be the case, then God is really our Father. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead, and I wasn't planning to say this, but it just comes to me, I will say it. When he rose from the dead, he said, I ascend on to my Father and your Father. Isn't that exciting? So he, he, he brought us to the place of being boldly able to say, God is my Father. So, if we're peculiar, we're royal priesthood, we, we are of God, we're above any king the earth ever knew. I don't care how much royalty you've seen, how much multi-millions of dollars have been spent to make somebody look like they're a great king. There has never been a person who existed who is like God. Because every king that ever existed with all his royalty and, and all the pomp and everything else that, that he or she had were born like you and I. And God is over all. He's the king of the whole universe. King of kings. Lord of lords. And we call him our father. So if that be the case, and he loves us so much, and he's got such a plan for us, seems to me you and I should be a little bit interested in what he would like to see us walking like. What is required of me as a believer? You know, when, when, it, comes, uh, when it comes down to this, technically, it, it's, it's like, a parent with his children. Parents with their children, if you would. Uh, every parent has a desire to see his or her children walk in their ways. And God is no different. God loves us with an everlasting love. But he is holy and righteous and he is he is so perfect, and he's looking to see you and I take those steps. He longs and yearns to see you and I walk in ways that make him pleased. Somebody shout amen. Now, let's look at a few scriptures that indicate how we're supposed to be walking. Ephesians 4 and 1, it says this, that we are to walk worthy of our calling. King James uses vocation, same thing. Walk worthy of our calling. And, uh, you know, I won't go into all these scriptures because if I were to do that, I'd have to, take, I'd have to take a whole morning for each of these points. And there's six here. That will be six hours. I'm not going to do that, okay? I'm just going to, to, to just touch these things. We're called on to holiness, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. We're called on to peace, 1 Corinthians 7, 15. We're called actually to glory, and, and, and in 1 Peter 1 and 3. Uh, we're called to walk worthy of the Lord, even. 
in, uh, in Colossians 1 and 10. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and 12, we're walk, called to walk worthy of God, worthy of the Lord, worthy of God, same thing. But I'm just saying it's there rep repetitiously saying to us to walk worthy. What does it mean to walk worthy of, of someone? What does it mean to walk worthy of God? Worthy of, of the Lord. And that scripture is there. Worthy of the Lord, worthy of God, worthy of our calling. It means to walk as becometh our calling. In other words, walk in a way that speaks well of your calling and of, of, what, of how you, you have accepted that calling. Walk as becometh. The Greek actually talks about walk as becometh our calling. Jesus, when he was getting baptized, he said, it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness in the third chapter of Matthew. You know, in other words, it becomes us. It's like us. It's what would be expected of us to walk in this way. So he said, walk worthy of your calling. Find out what you're called to and walk in a way that makes it look like you believe you're called in that way. Walk in a way that makes, makes people believe you're supposed to be holy. Walk in a way that makes people believe you're supposed to be a peaceful person. Walk in a way that makes people believe that you're expecting the power and the presence and the glory of God to show up in your life. Walk in a way that's worthy of your calling. Now, the converse of that would be if we were to walk in ways that contradicted our calling. It's possible to do that. And we may allude to that a little, little later on before I finish. But, <coughs> excuse me, in Ephesians chapter 5, secondly, we are to walk carefully. King James says circumspectly. That's basically carefully. Not as fools. Walk carefully, not as fools, redeeming the time. A fool doesn't care where he walks. He's not cautious. He's not careful. He's not watchful on all sides. And if you, if you bring that into the spiritual walk, you're understanding that, that the Word of God is telling us as Christians, hey, walk carefully. Watch what you say. Watch what you do. Watch where you go. Watch who, whom you associate with because all of these things will reflect whether you are walking worthy of your calling. All of these things will reflect whether God can look at you or me and say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Isn't that what he said about Jesus? He said it at his baptism. He said it at his, his, his transformation. He, he was pleased in the walk that Jesus walked. And you and I are commanded. We are exhorted. We, actually, the Apostle Paul, some of the things he's saying, he's pleading with, he's begging with the church. Listen, do it this way. Walk this way. Walk in a way that's worthy of who you are. Let the world know by your walk who you are. Walk carefully, not as fools. Only a fool don't care where he's walking. We should use caution in our spiritual lives. You know, there's a lot of junk on the go spiritually that could destroy you. In this hour, we, we've got people that are coming out. Jesus said before he comes back, there's going to be people coming and saying they are Christ. I find it interesting. We've got a bunch of people, man, several people that are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm actually Jesus reincarnated. Jesus came inside of me. I'm him now. <laughs> they are fools. The word of God calls them Fools. But we are not to walk as fools. We're to walk carefully. And, and when you take God's word 
and govern your life and govern your actions and go govern your words, govern your reactions to people. Even in your own house, how you respond to your husband, to your wife, to your children, how you respond to your mother, your father, you actually will be, will be walking worthy or unworthy of the calling that is on your life. You don't have to be right all the time. You don't have to have your way all the time. The world won't end if you don't get your way. Hello. And if you're proven wrong, and even if you know you're right and nobody accepts it, the world is not going to end. The sun will come up tomorrow. Most arguments and most dissensions in relationships come because somebody can't get somebody else to, to agree with them. And it's almost like, and, and, and I've been there. It's almost like you think, I can't live unless they see my point. I got a word for you this morning. Get over it. Second word, get over yourself. Amen? Amen. 1 John verse two, chapter 2, verse 6, rather. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. It says that we are to walk as he walked, and that's what we've been talking about in these two previous scriptures, to walk worthy and to walk carefully, circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time, making sure you make good use of your time. You can't spend all your time watching television or, or on, on, like Angie mentioned earlier this morning, you spend your time with your eyes in your phone or your Facebook all the time. You've got to give time to the Bible. You've got to give time to prayer. You've got to give time to, to fellowship. You've got to give time to the things of God. Otherwise, you're not walking carefully. You're not walking cautiously. We have to, we have to stir ourselves up in this thing. If you don't stir yourself up, nobody else is going to do it. You've got to make your mind up to do that. So we walk as he walked. According to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And uh, you say, well, I can't walk like Jesus walked. You can try. When a baby is like 12 months old, they see mom and dad walking so perfectly and getting around with, you know, perfect mobilization. They can go where they want. They can, they can walk down steps, walk up steps. They can stoop, bend jump, whatever, they see mom and dad doing that, and, and, and they're just about ready to learn to walk. It would be dumb for the child to spend the rest of his life saying, well, I could never be like that. So make the effort. Make the effort. We used to sing, to be like Jesus, all I want is to be like him. We need to make the effort to walk as he walked, to live as he lived. Try to change what needs to be changed. Fix what needs to be fixed. You may not be able to get it right the first time, but try it again. You know God is very, 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 I keep on going, patient. Why do you think the earth is still here? Why do you think all of these things are still going on with old messes? In the because God is very patient. The Bible says he's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish. He's giving opportunity, ample opportunity for people to repent and turn around. So we're to walk as he walked. Be patient with one another. Love one another and whatever. And number four, and I just alluded to that, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2, Paul said, walk in love. How do you walk in love? How do you walk in love? The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he said, now by the faith, hope, and love. King James uses charity. It could have easily been inter interpreted love. That's where charity comes from, love. But the greatest of these is love. Do you know the Bible says explicitly that God is, is love. You can't really walk in love until you walk in God. 
You can do an act of love, but you can't walk in love. An act that indicates love, but you can't really walk in love. You know, a lot of people that, that, that say they know God, but they don't know how to walk in love. We're, we're actually commanded to love God. Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. How do you command someone to love? When the whole world is wrapped up in, in some kind of superficial love, it's... it's, it's it's kind of like a, a superficial love. It's kind of like a, just a coating that seems to be love. And God says, thou shalt love the Lord. You cannot command somebody to love unless love is something a little different than this gushy feeling you get. This overwhelming feeling you get when you see somebody and you fall in love with that person. It's dangerous to fall into anything. You need to grow into love. We, 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 we got to be careful we don't spend our lives walking around, falling in ditches. Love ditches. I mean, relationship ditches. And I'm not just talking about, uh, you know, opposite sex. I'm talking about, like, relationship when you have a friend. Do you know how many friends don't know how to stay friends for a long time? Something goes wrong, and you don't see that person anymore. They walk away as if they never met you. All of these different types of love, agape, the God kind of love, phileo, the brotherly kind of love, eros, heros, whatever, it's a Greek word. I'm not Greek, it's all Greek to me. But, you know, the love between a man and a woman. And uh, all of these things have to have their origin in God or they will not fulfill what they're supposed to fulfill. They will never reach the fruition that's intended for them. They will, they will fall short of the intended purpose. Make your mind up. Walk in love. Walk as he walked. He walked in love. You know, when you stop and wonder about, you know, Jesus walked in the perfection of love, but he still went into a temple, took a whip, and, and, and I mean, he, 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 he cleaned the place out. There are people who are so... So super loving today, and if you did something like that, they would think, well, you're not walking in love. So what is love? Well, love is um, doing everything somebody wants you to do. Never saying no. <laughs> Always being nice. Well, Jesus failed the love test, didn't he? Because he wasn't even always nice from an outside perspective. Guy comes and says, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I, I want to go home and bury my father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. That doesn't sound very nice. A woman comes to him from a Syrophoenician. A woman comes to him, a Gentile, and she says, my daughter is grievously vexed of a devil. I need your help. He says, look, I, I, I'm only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. I've got no time for you. She says, yeah, but I need, help me. My daughter's crazy back to the devil. Help me. He says, I can't take the children's bread and give it to dogs. About there, everybody would have left the church. But being nice doesn't draw faith out of people. It just draws emotions. Being firm and being strong and being right sometimes is what love is all about. The woman's daughter got healed and delivered. You know that. Because she wasn't looking for somebody to pat her on the back and say, Oh, honey, it's going to be all right. Oh, oh, you're going to be fine. Every, oh, yes. 
That wouldn't have cut it. That would not have been the kind of love that would have fixed this woman. But she got her miracle. Amen? I want you to learn something here today. If we're going to walk like he walked, and we just said a few minutes ago in 1 John 2, 6, walk as he walked. He walked in love. And we're told to walk in love in Ephesians 5 and 2. So we need to learn what love really is, and we need to, we need to be stirring ourselves. We're living in a world that the love is, is so perverted. Matter of fact, we're living in a world where everything is perverted, man. Men are marrying men. Women are marrying women. I said a while ago, I reiterate, I'd rather marry my car than another man. Come on. And you, ex you expect that a world with that kind of perversion is going to be able to dictate the way you love? And we're supposed to get a definition of love from a world that will call you a homophobic if you don't accept a perverted lifestyle. That is where I get my definition of love. No, thank you very much. I'd rather go to the Word of God. Wouldn't you? You're going to walk in love. Learn to do what's right. Do it right because it's right. And then... The people that you encounter from day to day, you may not do everything they want you to do, but they'll know that in your heart you're doing what's right and what God wants you to do, and you'll be walking in love. Don't be always looking for somebody to pat you on the back and say, you're such a nice person. <laughs> but at the same time, you will be a nice person if you're a Christian, but you won't always seem nice because you won't always go along with the flow. That makes sense? Sure it does. First Corinthians 13 and 1 tells us that without love, we're, we're useless, actually. Everything we do becomes empty. You can even give your body to be burned. Can you imagine somebody doing that? Do you know people have died for stupid things? But without love, it means nothing. And God is love. Love is commitment to bringing about for you what we believe is God's perfect will, even if it doesn't go right with me or even if it doesn't seem right with the person we're dealing with. Let me hurry along. If we're, gonna, if we're going to walk the Christian walk, we're going to have to learn walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, everybody knows the scripture. For we walk by faith and not by sight. The stuff we feel, the stuff we see, the stuff we hear every day will not cut it if you're walking by faith. And what we need to understand is when you walk by faith, you are believing that God's way is the only way. How do you know what God's way is? How do you know what pleases God? There's only one bottom line for that, and it's the Word of God. You see, when you and I have all bitten the dust and this thing is over, the Word of God will still remain. There have been people who've tried to wipe this Bible out. They've tried to destroy it. They've made it their life's ambition to see the Bible is destroyed and totally wiped out and, and not another copy would be seen. It's still the best-selling book in the whole world. How could that be? Because the author of the book is the author of life and the creator of the universe. He's very patient 
He's long-suffering, but don't mess with him because he's still God. Paul said, don't mess with God. Remember what Paul said? He said, hey, be careful. Watch how you live. Live a life that pleases God because our God is a consuming fire. I want him on my side, don't you? I, I, I want to I know that he's my friend. He's my father. He's my hope, my help, my strength. He's my future, my destiny, my eternity. That's who he is. Give yourselves all another 40, 50 years, most of us here this morning, and you're going to be glad that your confidence was not in the natural things of life, but they were in this work. Get this in here, and you'll have a relationship with him. Amen? Walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is for the now. You won't need faith when you get to heaven. You need faith now to believe and trust God. Faith comes when you hear the Word of God. Every time the Word of God is preached, I believe every time it's read as well, every time you hear it reiterated by a brother or sister in fellowship, I believe it stirs faith up in us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's when you hear something about God, something inside you jumps. Yeah. I mean, all this old junk that's going on in the whole wide world, and there's a lot of it. From the stupid things we talked about a few minutes ago to the beheading of, of people who are innocent to the, to, to the, to the intention of, of, of religion to take over the whole world and make it, make it uh, under total bondage. All of these things, the fear of, 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 of a nuclear wipeout, all of, that, all of this stuff is, in spite of all of it, when you, when you make your mind up to believe the word of God, these things don't even matter. Because your faith is in him. Your faith is in the word of God. You've, you've stepped up and begin to realize that God, when you hear something from God, all of that stuff means nothing. I still maintain that you, as a, as a Christian, need to be able to, to make your mind up that you're willing to die for what you believe. Most people here today, you would, you would gladly give your life to protect your children, your household. You want to get to my family, you go through me. True word? Should we not ought to feel the same way about the things of God? Should we not feel the same way when it comes to, you, you cannot take my faith from me. I believe God. I'll die before I quit believing the word of God. Examine yourself. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, he said, examine yourself and find out whether you be in the faith. And, 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 and the way to examine yourself, ask yourself the question. If somebody bombarded your house today with guns and machetes and whatever and said, you give up this thing about God, you give up this thing about Jesus, you shut it all down and say, I don't believe the Bible, I don't believe in Jesus, or you die right now and your whole house dies. What would you do? See, that's where the challenge comes. That's where the challenge comes. We've been rocked to sleep in a gospel cradle. And if everybody doesn't pat us on the back or shake our hands when we're supposed to, 
do the things that make us feel good, we're ready to quit and, and give up serving God. When there are people in other, other parts of the world that are, are walking 10, 20 miles to get to a church service where they can worship with a bunch of God's people. There are people who are having, having a, a piece of paper with some scriptures wrote off so that they can read these scriptures regularly, and they don't have a Bible. We just sent, we just sent $500 to Zishan, uh, I can't remember his last name, in Pakistan to, to get Yurdo Bibles for the Pakistanians. He's got a church over there. We, we, we spent about $1,500 to get, to get like 6,000 Bibles into Bulgaria. That's where your missionary dollars are going in this church. That's where the tithe of this church is going to get the word into hands of people who don't have the Bible. And here we've got Bibles after Bibles after Bibles lying around in our house. We've got phones and iPods and iPads and, and, and computers with the Bible accessible to us on a regular basis and, and, and we're all caught up in frivolous foolishness and makes me ask the question what if you were challenged for your faith the Christian walk at one time meant that if you named the name of Jesus it could cost you your life what's that You see, right now, and I was talking to uh, my cousin last night. Lives hundreds of kilometers away from here. And uh, she was talking to me about someone close to her that's not born again. And she said, he believes in Jesus. He believes the Bible. He believes Jesus was born of a virgin. He believes all this stuff. I said, that's what makes you a Christian. You just need him to understand that he's pushing aside his Christianity for somebody's version of what Christianity is supposed to be. Get him to acknowledge this Jesus. Not to, not to line up with, with, with the do's and don'ts that somebody has created. Do you realize, and I said this to her, do you realize what he believes right now, if he's strong in it, he would die for overseas? You say, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he was born of a virgin. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he was buried. I believe that on the third day he rose again. I believe that he's coming back again. That is what makes you a believer. Yeah, but you said, well, what about, what about all the rest of this stuff? I got to quit this and quit that and quit the other thing. Yeah, work it out. Walk it out. That's what I'm talking about. There's a walk that God is wanting you to walk so you can bring heaven to earth and then enjoy your walk while you're going to heaven. But believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is the bottom line right there. That's where it starts, right there. I, don't, I, I'm not, I, I cannot afford to tell you you have to do my little thing. No, believe in Jesus. Anybody watching this online, I'm telling you, commit to believing that Jesus is the Christ. That's Christianity. The rest of it, God will deal with that and he'll deal with you. What does your faith say? You know, a lot of people don't believe Jesus ever walked the earth. They don't believe he was the son of God. I do. Do you believe that? How many of you believe Jesus is the son of God? How many of you believe he died for your sins? How many of you believe he was buried and rose again on the third day? How many of you believe he's coming back again for those that believe in him? Yeah. How simple is the gospel? The devil spends his time on a regular basis trying to rob you of that commitment. To rob you of the peace that you can have knowing that you are a Christian. Knowing that you're born again. Knowing that you love God. When we get back to walking, we have to ask ourselves, yes, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is he your father? Are you committed to God the Father through Jesus? Because if so, 
that he calls you, urges you, begs you. These, these words are all there in the different translations you get into them. To walk so people know that you are a believer. So that the world can see in you who you are. What you are. Do you know the Bible says that every one of us will be judged for the deeds done in our body? Body is a strange thing. You realize that? The body is a strange thing. Your spirit man has been recreated when you accepted and believed that Jesus is the Christ. That's what happens there. Faith in him changes you from darkness to light, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And then there is this quest of the devil to get your body and to make your body do the things of his kingdom where God is calling you and urging you and pleading with you to do the things pertaining to his kingdom. That's where this thing lies right there. For we walk by faith because we believe, not by sight. I'm going to close. One more thing I want to say this. We walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. I could carry this thing and go on and talk to you for another 40 minutes. And we could talk about the danger of stepping outside of the grace of God. You don't have to. I believe that we have to know who he is, believe who he is, and walk as he walked. Live as he lived as best we can. And when we use our faith to do that, we are actually beginning to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, it says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, people won't see the other kingdom coming out in your life. They won't see the works of the flesh coming out in your life. They'll see the fruit of the Spirit. There are two kingdoms. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you step into the kingdom of God. And your responsibility is to learn how to walk in that kingdom. That's what we're doing. Or you can just forget about it and walk away as if you never ever heard that Jesus is Christ. Your choice, your decision, your whole life is a decision. Every day you make decisions to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. Walking in the spirit is basically listening to God. Now, a lot of people think walking in the spirit is just, well, you just don't smoke, cuss, drink, or run around. I believe that's included. Amen? I mean, it's nice to quit a lot of that junk. Some of it send you to hell. Some will just make you smell bad until you get to wherever you're going. But the Bible has a lot to say about your attitude. It has a lot to say about how you, how you talk. What you talk. Who you talk about. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, you'll listen to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God because they are in agreement. If you're being led by the Spirit, you will never contradict the Word of God. I'll say that again before I close. If you're going to walk in the Spirit, you will never contradict. Anytime you contradict the Word of God, you are not walking in the Spirit. 
Anytime you go against what the Bible says, you are not walking in the Spirit. Now, I want to just capitalize on this before I finish. If you don't walk in the Spirit, and if you don't walk in the Word of God, you will feel condemnation. And it, it, it can be a, a, a condemning feeling, but basically, in a lot of cases, it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit drawing you back to his word instead of being out in the flesh. There is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Who walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If you walk in the flesh... You will feel condemned because your heart will condemn you. You won't feel comfortable when somebody quotes a scripture verse. You'll think they're preaching at you. I mean, I can get up and preach just a scripture, just basically, man, this is what the Bible says. And people walk out and say, well, he's preaching at me. I don't like this message of condemnation. (laughs) It's not condemnation. It is exhortation to walk in the Spirit. And it's not just for somebody, well, you know, I got this problem. I still smoke. Well, my dear, I tell you, there's people with bigger, bigger problems than that. <laughs> we, we've uh, we spent our whole lifetime. Do you know some of the, some of the revivalists of old? Like uh, people that we quote, you know, some of these old-time Men of God, and and please, I'm not advocating that smoking is good. It's bad for your health. It'll kill you, potentially. But some of these guys used to smoke all the time. They had their pipes. They just didn't have the revelation from the natural. The doctors didn't didn't know the truth, that this stuff could damage you. So they, I mean, a lot of these ministers, they would be studying their Bible with their pipe in their hand. That's true. You can study it yourself. I mean, go Google it. Fellows that you thought were, oh. You knew some of them, you'd say, oh, dear. (laughs) Who are you? Listen, God's got some straightening out to do. He's got some work to do. He's been at it for a long time. And after he's finished with everybody, he's got you to deal with. (laughs) And after he's finished dealing with you, God have mercy. He's got me to deal with. But if, if, if we capitalize on these, these, these external things that are damaging and they can be deadly, and I believe that God can't be pleased when we're doing damage to our bodies. Sugar can kill you just as quick as nicotine. It's just that we've got this stigma about nicotine. It stinks too. Please understand that. And... You and I need to be able to level this out so that we don't get into a religious attitude. And a lot of independent, charismatic people are more religious than people that they accuse of being religious because we got this thing that we preach and we, 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 we declare. And if somebody's not walking in this particular way, then they can't be saved. Yeah, they can be saved. They just need to change a few things. And God's working on them. He's trying to get them to quit smoking. He's trying to get quit, you to quit gossiping. He's trying to get that person to quit this other thing he's doing, and he's trying to get you to to, to, to stop overeating. And the Bible says more about gossiping and gluttony than it does about the other things, by the way. Is this the truth? or, or, I mean, you can say amen or you can say ouch, but this is the truth. I cannot but preach the truth. I mean, am am I talking about this because I want to smoke on the sly? No, I can't stand this stuff. I'm just saying you've got to be open with the word. You cannot cannot allow your, your idea of the Christian walk to be it, even if it contradicts the word of God. You've got to be careful. Otherwise, you judged of God yourself. You see? I've been around this, this thing a lot. I've known people who wouldn't drink, smoke, cuss, or anything else, but they did a lot of other stuff. They hold bills to, to merchants. And I've walked, you know, into stores where they've made statements about somebody who was, who was in, in, uh, 
in, 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 a, in a place of, of leadership in a church and say, you know, if all Christians are like that, they don't pay their bills, I don't want no part of it. Oh, yeah, but I guess he couldn't pay. Listen, if you can't pay your bills, go tell them you can't. Don't just run away and, and, and avoid that place. I'm talking about walking as a Christian. That's my message this morning. We cannot get hung up on the cardinal sins of drinking and smoking and, 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 and some of these other trivial things and let the stuff that's destroying the heart be ignored while we deal with these external things. Yes, like Jesus said, these ought you to have done, but don't leave the other on done. Let's get this thing so that we're learning to walk right. And let's not criticize the one. I mean, the person who, who may be dealing with some of our, our little things that we don't like and we can't stand may have the other stuff that we're working on all worked out. You don't know how many people could be offended because of your little lifestyle. You don't know. So let's, let's learn to walk as Christians. Has he walked? And he'd meet people, and the first thing he'd want them to find out was that, do you know about this water that's available? That'll give you a life that you'll be able to live eternally, blessed. When you met the woman at the well. He's looking for you to get a hold of something that's genuine and real. And all this other junk that we've carried for years will fall off when we get close enough to God. Is that true? The Christian walk is about getting close to God. And the closer you get to him, the more these things start dropping off. So are we going to pick out certain things and categorize certain things and bring people under condemnation or are we going to bring them into the gospel and into the light of the word and say, listen, draw close to the Lord. He'll draw close to you and he'll start helping you get rid of these things.